The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Drew Meredith, welcome to this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast. How you going? Pretty good. That's good. It's been a big week. It's been a week. I think we say this every week now, don't we? <laughs> yeah, it's been a week. Um, it's been a day. Yes. What have you been working on? Lots and not much. <laughs> Lots and not much. I was the, the guy at the cafe uh, where I get my coffee down yeah. in uh, at East Ivy this morning. <laughs> East Ivy, yeah. I said, what do you do with yourself? I said... <laughs> Uh, a financial advisor. Oh, then you own the bar. Yeah, yeah. And then we do some podcasting and yeah. media stuff as well and run some events. And yeah, it's <laughs> hard and so, to explain. I just said, I look at my diary when I come in the morning and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and then move everything around. Probably about the same as you. Yeah, yeah. It's about that. How, yeah, many, I, how many are you filming or recording well, a week at the moment? Well, I think I think it's between six and ten. A week, <laughs> That's a broad, yeah. but we have it's 11, a broad spectrum. We basically have 11 co-hosts now, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, which is really cool. I still love it. Don't get me wrong, but I do prefer listening to episodes. I can't listen to my own voice. I hate it. Yeah, not so, your voice, my voice. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> but I do. I do like that our property podcast predominantly doesn't need me, so I do yeah. like to listen to that. Um, I do listen to our two cent segments just to cringe at myself <laughs> and go, "Is that a compliance risk?" <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, media compliance, not yeah, financial no, advice no, no, compliance. No, no, let's be clear there. Yeah, yeah, media compliance. Like, should I have said that? <laughs> um, but that's what this is all about, eh? We're just here for the fun of it. Um, but now the last week, like, I just I had lunch. We had a podcast, and then I invited him to lunch with us just now. Uh, Michael Kemp, who was the the lead analyst for the Barefoot Investor Blueprint, so Scott Papes, oh, cool. making newsletter. He came in earlier on today. Oh, they're still talking to you after your um. Oh, after you corrected them, <laughs> corrected them on their Twitter policy. Yeah, it seemed to be all good. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if he, uh, Mark, has a, a, a say on that. But he's really interesting. I'd say he's probably one of the most well-read investors I've ever come across. Maybe even the most well-read. Excellent. Yeah, outside of Andrew Derrimuth, Esquire, of course. <laughs> I don't um, think he reads. Actually, he has some pretty. <laughs> <laughs> he just absorbs it naturally. <laughs> yeah, just plugged into his brain. So, uh, actually, Mike Kemp has a few choice words for economists, and he's a, there's a book that he referenced, and he goes, if you get to the end of that, and then you still believe in economists, <laughs> you, get, you need your head read. <laughs> Can I have the book? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, but it just made me think of all the calls that we make on the show. <laughs> and there it is. Um, Spoke to David Tuckwell just a few minutes ago. Um, he is the son of Graham Tuckwell, yep. founder of ETF Securities, world's first gold ETF, etc. Told me some really interesting things actually. The STW ETF was Australia's first ETF, and I've always wondered why is it called STW? Doesn't that sound? Is it like State Street, street something? But it was actually because it was called Street, street. Trackers. Yeah. Um, Did I get the? No, I don't know w? The w. I don't know the w <laughs> but it was originally used. He said by people who wanted to as an alternative to futures contracts. Yep. So that was quite interesting. So a fund is hedging their yeah. position or yeah. keeping exposure while selling down stocks or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I was in Sydney yesterday, spoke to Jody Stanton, who is the CEO and co-founder of Rush Gold, which is 
Um, it's now grown to a pretty big network of like a financial services ecosystem right around the country and world. It's like democratizing gold or couponizing. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. You can take a tiny stake in gold or you can take a big stake. Then they processed everything from $1 to $1 million, um, of you, people getting exposure to it. Bit of a jet setter. Bit of a jet setter, yeah. Sat next to a friend of mine on the plane. <laughs> um, we won't talk about that. Um, and we had – actually, in your spot there, it should be feel very uh, – I don't know how many people you can fit in the studio, but we definitely pushed it last week when we had the ATO assistant commissioner in here. Uh, there was six or seven of us in the room and it was getting <laughs> hot. Or? Yeah, there was a lot of PR and stuff. But ATO assistant commissioner Tim Lowe came into the studio. It was great to chat to him. Um, we also had after that, which was ironic. Thanks so we, for not introducing. You're very welcome. <laughs> I don't think you were in the office, actually. Oh, good. Yeah, um, you probably don't. I, don't, I just actually was more worried about you, so I didn't want to introduce you to the ATO and be like, and here's Andrew Derrimuth. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, hmm, I don't see I'm his tax income. file number. <laughs> they just have like a beacon that just goes off. Like, they know straight away. They can see right through you. Um, but then interestingly, an hour after that conversation with Tim Lowe, the assistant commissioner of the ATO, I spoke with a guy called Karan Anand. <laughs> He is the CEO in Australia of a product called, or a platform called Henry, which is- Insurance? No. So Henry without the E. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> I take the E out. You don't want that in there. Um, who wants an E in Henry? Andrew that's, without the E. That's a Derimuth. I guess it's a derivation. Um, but he, they basically have built what I would characterize as oh, zero for sole traders. Yep. It's an- really interesting business for consultants, people that do freelance work. They take 1% of the sole trader's income and automatically file taxes, can automatically dollar cost average, can automatically automate your money. They do your tax returns as part of it. The fee is capped. It's really impressive. That's great. For well, sole traders, yeah. it's super impressive. That's what I think a lot of people running their own business get caught out on PAYG, not PAYG, or BAS. Yeah, Port BAS. BAS. GST if you're yeah. over 75K. Yeah. And so these people that use that are like doctors who are consultants or freelance designers or tradies use it. And a lot of people use it in Australia. But um, I was like, oh, this is a really interesting company. I love Zero. I would love to invest in this private company. And then he said they did a $60 million raise. And I was like, oh, <laughs> guess I'm not at the table. <laughs> So, moving on. Um, yeah, that was in the last week and also rented my bathroom and kitchen. Rented or renoed? Renoed. Renoed. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So, that took it out of me. Um, we decided last Saturday night that we would reno the kitchen and bathroom before the following Saturday. We? I. <laughs> Let's be while clear. still working. Um that really took it out of me, to be honest. But um, it was more of a lipstick on a pig job, let's be honest, <laughs> because it, uh, I didn't do it. I kept all the plumbing in the same spot, All well, moved a little bit of electricity, but I mean, <laughs> what's a little bit of electricity between friends? Um, so, yeah, it was all good. Here we are. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I had, yeah, it was a lipstick reno job, to put it in perspective, what it cost, it was less than 10 grand. So, yeah, just like using a lot of the existing cabinets and all that sort of stuff and really cosmetic stuff. Wax and paint on it. Wax and paint. We still haven't bought the stove though, so let's hold our breath. Um, <laughs> so, how about Andrew Derrimuth? What's going on in the world of an Australia senior economist? I mean, we got a call out for this uh, young people in finance event. Oh, yes. We've got to do up. that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. If you're in finance, male, female, advisor. Under 40. Under 40. Or under 40. Feel, this, is, this is very okay. <laughs> painful for me because- 40. <laughs> 40. Oh, are you not invited? I'm not allowed to go. <laughs> so, you, there's like a heart. It's not uh, like it's no, not it's less more than like a, if you feel- Less than or un- equal to, it's like- As no. long as you feel. So, it's not going to be restrictive. All, but so, if you feel is, under 40, yeah. <laughs> so you would be coming along then. Depends on the day, but yeah. If you're post-franking credits- <laughs> You're okay. You're okay. So, what's going to happen? Um, uh, the idea is just to bring the the we we employ a lot of younger people in financial services in our businesses, and it's really to bring uh, help encourage those younger leaders to to network and and meet other people in the industry, which can be quite difficult mm. whether you're working from home or whether you're you know in in big businesses or big corporates. So, mm. uh, end of financial year, thirtieth of June, happens to be at the bar that we are also part of as well. Okay, and there'll be I think. Can we uh, say the name? The name of the bar, if, if you like. It's beneath Driver Lane in Melbourne. Yes, Jazz Bar. 
um, really cool, funky underground. So a bit too funky. Yeah. How do people get involved if they if they're in finance and they are in down here in EOFI? I think we'll have a link hopefully in their show notes and share it around uh, after this. Okay. Yes, I don't see it. Not you there nodded, yet, You nodded yes. at the show notes as if I would know this, but uh, yes, we don't. I do not know, but we need this. So, if you are in or around Melbourne on the thirtieth of June, please register your interest. If you feel under forty, I would really love someone to push the envelope on that. Like, how feeling under forty can you get? You know what I'm saying? Twenty. <laughs> <laughs> if you listen to what we talk about, it can be twenty. So, but that'd be heaps of fun. I'm coming along. I believe it. Yeah. Um, Kate will be there. Yeah, put Kate on the spot. Come on up and meet Kate. Yeah. <laughs> Kate. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll be hiding in the corner, but come and meet Kate. No, it'd be heaps of fun because it is really important. I think we, uh, the finance industry is typically built around a lot of older professionals in the industry, but there's a new wave of younger people that are coming through and it's really, really great to see. Yeah, an idea that came directly from our team. So it was- Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. What else? I was just reading, so Baron Joey, old Jonathan Mott, who used to do, I think he was at UBS before, now he's at Baron, I mean, everyone's at Baron Joey. Yeah. He's always done a lot. Who is it? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I won't say who. Um, He's he's always done a lot of work on property sector and it's become like it's so relevant at the moment, what's going on in the property market. They're now predicting prices are going up (laughs) and you're seeing prices go up in parts of the property market. At the same time, you're seeing like a massive, as we get in the questions and probably the finance podcast too, there's mortgage prisoners Mm. (laughs) increasing more and more in every part of the market. And then I think we mentioned last week, New Zealand's finished interest rate hikes and they're they're reducing the LVR or the loan to value ratios on new mortgages as well. So uh, I think he said something like as many as, is it 24% of borrowers would struggle to refinance at current rates. So mm. that's because they had a 3% serviceability buffer to work out what rate you can afford. So essentially you're being assessed on an 8% mortgage rate, mm. even though it's at five, mm. uh, to have that flexibility. Mm. Um, so he's expecting you know, arrears, so people behind on their repayments to increase significantly towards the end of the year um, and put forward all kinds of work. The, the big question is, you know, you could see all this data and say, oh my God, you know, property market's going to crash. But that is thinking about the situation in a vacuum, isn't it? Mm, I think so. And yeah. then talked about how parts of the property market are now doing well, mainly because there's no volume. Uh, wealthy people have still got no no issue getting capital. And then a whole heap of people have fallen out of the market that can't afford to get a mortgage to, and have given up on buying first homes at the same time. So they called it the haves and have nots of property. You know, um, I'll make, because you make a prediction, right? I'll make a prediction that house prices won't fall over the next three years. But like anything that these, not necessarily this one, but any of those people that write uh, columns for the AFR might suggest, um, I will make a prediction that the only thing that will bring down house prices from here is severe regulation. Yeah. So we are going to see, and I might even be able to get this episode cross-posted here on the Investors Podcast. If you haven't already checked it out, um, Chris Bates recently interviewed Simon Kushtamaka from um, the Demographics Group, I think it yeah. is, um, on the, the Property Podcast. And he tied in all of the demographics that we see in Australian society today, immigration, baby boomers, millennials, who love their you know, their foam lattes but have to move a bit further out because they can't afford to buy in a city and whatever, um, and how this all into plays. But he brings it back into one fine point, which is that at the end of the day, what we're going to see is a massive, well, I'm paraphrasing in my interpretation, like a big hammer drop on property because things like beach houses, Airbnbs, these will all be punished, yeah. severely punished. You stored it in the budget last week. It's yeah, the starting. Victorian budget is the first mover on that for sure. I heard, I heard that in a cafe today too. I yeah. think someone said they were getting 100 grand in rent yeah. uh, and paid 25 grand in land tax. Yeah, which well, I mean, one side you're getting hundred grand in rent, so you're yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're not you doing can too bad. It, yeah, but uh, the point is, it's changing, right? It's changing in a big way, I think, and it has to because I know people are going to disagree with me, and I'm someone that's sitting on equity in my house, and I'm thinking I could do something with this, but the the regulatory risk around property investment is yeah. meaningful. I would say if you are trying to assume what happened in the past ten years is going to happen in the next ten years as house prices go up. Oh, I wouldn't want to be going all in on that. And I think interest rates are worsening inequality at the same time. You're kind of seeing it because less houses are being constructed, which will make it mm. reasonable unless legislation changes significantly. Um, mm. you know, without that change, it becomes 
you know, it's, uh, it's unattainable for more and more people. Another thing that's really interesting about this is um, that we don't have any major death taxes in Australia. Unless someone completely stuffs up their superannuation, there's no major consequences for dying other than death for the person that dies, of course. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the people that get the money after that, there's no major consequence. So Only from super. Yeah, that's what I mean. There's only from super. So your job's probably going to get harder in the future because you have to find more interesting ways to work with that. Yeah. But I feel like that's a regulatory risk as well that I see for the inheritance. Because if you talk about inequality, well, the easiest way to get inequality is just to perpetuate big balances being passed on to the next yeah. generation. They're yeah, attacking super at the moment on that. And yeah, yeah. Be that's the next. Interesting. There, once they get this, you know, thing done with super, this not cap, cap, not cap. Um, then the next thing may be, well, how do we more broad, take this more broadly? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've been seeing people everywhere outraged by the Victorian government's changes to all these like stamp duty investment properties. Um, really, people that I didn't think were political. Anyway, and it doesn't have to be interest rate cuts that help the property market. Go on. This year. <laughs> so uh, this is part of the Jonathan Mott report as well. He was talking about you know, the banks have the ability to extend loan terms, which actually reduces your payment as well. So if you had a 30-year mortgage, it's down to five, but your payments are going up because of interest rates, they could reissue that at 30 years and yeah. um, provide flexibility because it's not in their interest to- Well, that's it. To the whole default. system's not designed. They don't want you to fail. No one wants you to. And then they could switch LVRs um, and uh, you probably get the regulator step in at some point to reduce that serviceability buffer before- yeah rate cuts, unfortunately, for me. Even how people <laughs> assess. <laughs> yeah. Um, unfortunately, I was I'm, thinking- I'm backpedaling <laughs> every week now. As I was listening to like Mike Kemp talk about economists making calls, <laughs> I was thinking of Andrew Derrimuth, Esquire, and thinking, how wrong is he going to be when January <laughs> rolls <around?"> I quit. <laughs> uh, in other news, uh, debt ceiling deal made. Yep. This is in the US. And this is- I don't know. It's- I know I keep referring to yours and Kate's. Um, I think you did a few posts on financial headlines and how bad they are for making sound investment decisions. Oh. Like every two years, the debt ceiling is hit. Every two years, they make a deal on it. Yeah, maybe it's a week later than usual, but every the same every time, all the experts will come out and tell you how bad it is. The U.S. government's going to default. The whole global economy is going to fall into massive recession, and bank U.S. It's never defaulted. It's not going to default. It's never going to default. <laughs> That's another prediction. Oh, um, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Got it. But Sorry, uh, maybe when I'm past <laughs> in 60 years. No inherited um, tax, go on. But it, it, we tend to like extrapolate and, and love the headlines that are about bad things happening, even if they're incredibly unlikely. Mm. And then the amount of people who've been worried about that and making investment decisions has been kind of crazy to us. Whereas you always knew something would happen. Everyone wants to be, you know, public service want to be paid at some point mm. uh, and you can't just stop. So it's just a reminder of avoiding the headlines rather than focusing on what's the, the most topical issue and allowing that to drive short-term decisions. Isn't it just because people don't understand how money is made? <laughs> like, like the sausage machine. <laughs> the, yeah. Well, imagine you have a mortgage and you're about to default on it What do you, and you could just print more money. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's I'll fine. pay it off. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pay more. They're only allowed to spend two percent more next year. It wasn't that was the agreement. So then there's another political another thing trillion. In, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it was but another it's, trillion. Get Bill Mitchell back on. I'd love to interview him. Yeah, he'd be again. great. Yeah, imagine if he stepped into the lion's den right here with us too. He'd, uh, he'd be just looking at us. Teach like, us a lesson. I'm an academic. You can't talk like this around me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so other other news. Nikkei hits a, a high. I thought that thing was at like I thought that thing could never go up. <laughs> Well, they, uh, I was listening to another, you know, animal spirits as usual on the way in. Yes, go on for it. Like the biggest bubble in history was the Nikkei in the 1990s. And it's finally got back to the, the 1990 highs. Yeah. Well, have you seen the chart on that thing? No, I haven't. But I, I do muse at a chart. Hold on a second. I'll get it up. I've got a good buy, hold, sell for you as well. Okay. Nikkei chart. Here we go. Um, I do remember hearing, shout out to Charlie Munger fans on Twitter. He used to back. talk about this a lot. But geez, the data doesn't go back that since far. 2010, that thing's been rampaging. Definitely. Currency helps. Yeah. It's gone from, um, just to, for context for someone that can't see exactly what I'm looking at, <laughs> it's gone from 10,000 to 31,000. Yeah. That's a 3X. Massive. 3X for an index. In a decade. Toyota. Toyota. Mazda. What else you got for me? Nintendo? <laughs> Sony. Oh, yeah. Not Samsung. That's all I got. 
<laughs> constituents. Um, but those, are, yeah, those are some good names. I Toyota, no, Camry is great car. Um, I'm going to buy hold sell for you. Fuji Kura Citizen Watch, Xerox, Kobe Steel, Japan Steel M3. Um, I'm just reading off the names of it. Trend Micro. A lot of these companies I haven't heard of. I don't even know if they're in there. That's just what Yahoo Finance says. Anyway, um, okay. So we do. We are going to take some questions in just a moment. Uh, but there is a couple of things that we should highlight. One of them being Paladin, a really interesting business. Uh, Drew, do you have a Paladin machine at home? This is Connected Fitness, by the way. Paladin? Oh, Paladin. Oh, let's take that again. I was thinking... You can just don't just run with it. <laughs> Go Paladin, for- the energy, the uranium company. Ah, uranium. I was thinking like Connected Fitness. You know how I'm thinking. Paladin. Peloton. Yeah, Peloton. That's what I was thinking. No, this place creates this, uranium. This Pepsi Max was, is gone. did create uranium. This Pepsi Max has gone to my head. Um, ABV 4.2. <laughs> yeah. I swear, it's no sugar. <laughs> I haven't drank sugar in years. Look at my- <laughs> the rum you put in there. <laughs> Go on. So, Paladin, tell me about it. Uh, it's just another, like, we've got a question on small caps in yeah. later on in here and okay. why active or passive versus active in small caps. It wasn't the question, but that's what my answer was. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the stock dropped 20% today because the government of Namibia is talking about nationalizing their, their uranium mines in Namibia. So it's kind of the, the risks of individual smaller companies where there is an informational edge or you introduce things like geopolitical risk or legislative risk in other countries. So just a reminder of how challenging it is to invest outside the you know the blue chips and the mm. importance of diversification mm. yeah absolutely um and a lot of that stuff happens anyway right with many mining businesses but particularly when especially you're going when there's natural resource yeah yeah that's an emerging market risk right um okay great and other news like uh, cobalt blues come out with something um IDP, IDP had a rough. IDP rough got day. whacked because there was approval of. My understanding is there was approval of a few other test providers overseas, a couple of others, and people didn't know exactly what was going on. Yeah, exactly. I think they, they're. Um, this is market education basically provider. got opened up. They're yeah. like an online education provider owned by Australian universities, but sold last year, I think. Yeah. And one of their markets in Canada was basically open. They lost thirty percent potential to lose thirty percent market share. Mm, yep. Um, it's a yeah. It's a really interesting one. So this. Let's move on to buy, hold, sell this week because <clears throat> there are some good ones in here. So uh, we will get to your questions just after this. Uh, buy, hold, sell for Drew Meredith, aka uh, Andrew Derrimuth. Uh And the reason that uh, we do these is to have a bit of fun, to poke a bit of fun at uh, the finance industry because we know how silly the buy, hold, sell is. But we do find it hilarious that when we when we bring these things in, and hopefully you do too. Um, buy, hold, sell, Paladin. It feels like personal advice. It's not personal advice. Not pers- never I'll personal I'll do the advice. disclaimer in a yeah. second. But I so think I'd say more on uranium. I'd be a sell. So you sell on, on Paladin? Just uranium in general. Why? From a portfolio perspective. Why? Why? Is- nuclear power versus literally all the other power sources that we potentially have. So you're saying sell on uranium? Yeah. So you're saying nuclear is no good, no bueno. I'm not saying it's not bueno. I'm saying <laughs> there's, there's better alternatives. Okay. I'm going to get some complaints about this one. Yeah, <laughs> this is going to be Lee outrageous. Matthews, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Lee Matthews. <laughs> For those of you that didn't come to the Melbourne-based event, Lee Matthews, AFL legend, greatest player slash coach of all time. Um, he, <laughs> <laughs> he, <laughs> stocks. He, he was very cautious on stage at our finance event the whole time, except then equity mates Bryce and Wren probed him and said, what's one investment? And he's like, I don't really know, but if I had to pick one uranium, <laughs> just run straight up the risk curve, right to the pointiest end. Um, hopefully, for Lee, it works out. Fingers crossed. Um, buy, hold, sell Pepsi. Pepsi or Pepsi Max? Pepsi Max. Uh, I'm a buy. I'm buying the, Pepsi Max. I did buy it today at lunch with Michael. But um, <laughs> I say sell. Do you honest. like it? Well, I don't mind Pepsi Max, but I think Coke No Sugar is just eating everyone's lunch. Anything no sugar, it all tastes the same. Yeah. I always wonder what they put in it, but it's all that the whole thing like die skinny, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. This is going to be one close to home given your, your family's association in this business. Uh, buy, hold, sell, uh, Andrew Derrimuth's goat's cheese. I'm a massive buy on goat's cheese. Yeah. Best thing, add it to a salad, maybe some- uh, what do you uh, snow? You know, some sliced snow peas, or oh, wow. yeah, spread it on a bit of sourdough. Oh my! Yeah, I know you were you were buying on the veggie market the other day. Yep. So this is yeah. So just so we can confirm, Kate Campbell 
is the daughter, the great granddaughter of Campbell's Soup, <laughs> and Drew Meredith is the godson of Derem, uh, not Derem, it's uh, Meredith's Coast 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 Coast. Coast. <laughs> Okay. I'm surrounded by loyalty. Send me, send me some free stuff, please. <laughs> no, but neither of those things are true. Okay, so you've got one for me. You I've got a higher lower for you. A higher or a lower? Okay. So you should know this given you're so involved in markets, but I'm, I'm going to give you a higher or lower for the index, year to date index performance for each of these benchmarks. So I have to tell you whether they're higher or lower. Then a point, then a percentage, I say. Not the not okay. the, oh, the actual. Yep. And, so the, and is it- Don't okay, overcomp- So it's just don't the number. It. There's no, okay. So I'm, not, I'm just like, you're going to give me a number and I'm going to go higher or lower. Yep. Okay, go. So the Dow Jones, high, up, up or down more? No. Higher or lower. Return of 5%, higher or lower year to date? Higher. Lower. Down 0.1%. Oh. NASDAQ. Yeah. Here's a here's a tough one. Thirty five percent positive, higher or lower. Higher. Thirty seven point five percent year to date wow. return from the Nasdaq. The only reason I know that because you just said Fang I could put be your best. Oh, yeah, because you he drew us to tell me he's like Fang could be my best call of all time. Um which is the Fang ETF, by the way, from Global like, sponsor of the finance podcast for disclosure. Next one. ASX two hundred. Ten percent. Oh, it's going to be close. I feel like it's going to be really close. It really depends it's on not where total I set return? this mark, isn't it? Uh, just the XJO on Google. Okay, so that's not total return. Um, I would say just lower. So 3.7%. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah, right. Okay. Yep. Okay, right. I was well Reportedly off. Totally positive. Yeah, so I just biased to the upside, I guess. Yeah. Pretty positive guy. Optic- <laughs> <laughs> so, so, wait. So, give us the numbers again. Dow Jones was what? Down 0.1% year to date. NASDAQ was what? 37. Up 37%. You talk about a skew to technology. 37%. <laughs> wow. Imagine if you owned the Dow Jones ETF. I don't know if there is one. You do but- the SPX. That'd be similar to. Mm. ASX 200? 3.7. And the wow. SPX is up 10. Wow. Or the SP 500 is up 10%. Wow. It goes to show how redundant the Dow Jones is. For those of you that don't know, in finance, it's commonly the talked Dow about. Dow Jones. The, the, how... Mm, it's current. It's often talked about or remarked how kind of like null and void that index is nowadays because it only includes thirty stocks, and they're not always representative of the broader market. In this case, it had a great year last year. But then they had an issue um, when they started removing some of the big oil companies. Yeah, the year they, before, and they replaced it with like Apple and all yeah. these other tech and then, stocks. Then the oil companies took off the following year. So the Dow Jones includes thirty. The Nasdaq is a hundred. The S and P five hundred is five hundred. The ASX 200 is 200. So I just think it's too narrow of an index to be representative. The whole point of the Dow Jones Industrial Index was to represent industrialized companies. Yeah. So that's the that's the whole point of that index, which makes it quite different to most of the other indices that are just tracking the broad market. Okay, so disclaimer. Anything that you hear on this podcast is strictly limited to general financial information only. We do not know your personal circumstances. If you want personalized advice, we highly recommend that you seek the advice and counsel of a licensed and trusted financial planner. You can find one on the Money Smart website by searching for a financial advisor's name, uh, and you can also see what they're authorized to give you advice on. Drew Meredith right here is a financial planner, but even if we answer your questions, they are strictly limited to general financial advice only, once again, because we do not know circumstances. If we do talk about an ETF or something like this, like a managed fund, please refer to that fund's product disclosure statement and target market determination or TMD. How many more are they going to give us? We've got PDS, <laughs> TMD, FSG. Knows, FSG. Who knows what comes to this? PP, privacy policy. I don't know. I just made that up on the spot, but it sounds good. PP. No, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. Bro, no go with VSO says this is a, this is a, that's the question and name, by the way. Lads, can you please. Bro down. We said no more We're bros. To be less, bro. <laughs> we said no more bros. And he starts with lads or she starts with lads. Can you bro down on VSO? What are the pros and cons? What are pros fit- and cons? <laughs> Would it fit in your core portfolio? Is there any point? W W A D D in brackets. What would Andrew Derrimuth do? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a year into investing. Have VAS and VGS for myself and IVV for my kids. I do plan to start investing in individual companies once I've won and completed your course, Owen. Keep up the banter. That was a leading hint. 
the person obviously wants to win this week's best yeah. question and name, so they get a free pass to the Value Investor course. We'll probably do a sale of that before the end of the financial year, FYI, if you are interested. Um, Drew, I'll start with you. This is a good portfolio construction question, and that's why I kind of led it with that Paladin discussion earlier. Uh, so VSO is the Vanguard Small Ordinaries mm-hmm. Index Tracker. Yep. So basically it tracks 199, 200 companies that are outside the top is it outside the ASX 100? Uh, I've, just got the, I've got the full definition because I don't want to get it wrong. But the average market cap, the median market cap, just FYI, is $3 billion. Yeah, so it's still quite large. Yeah. And that'd just be X100, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because to be that that's a pretty big thing. I'll get to the top. Big names. in Australia, Atlas pretty Arteria, tiny globally. That'd yeah. be a small cap. Car globally. sales, all cam, right. evolution mining. You get the Market picture. cap globally. Yeah. I mean, we the way we think about it, I think- as, as you've heard us talk about, one of our golden rules is it's, you know, you want to be product agnostic and style agnostic. So that means we think there's a role for both passive or index tracking ETFs and mm. funds, as well as active management. And I mean, we had a call with NZ Super, the, the big um, massive industry super fund in New Zealand, and their approach is like 66% passive and 33% highly active and they use specific managers in specific parts of the market. So it could be private equity, emerging markets. And for us, smaller companies is one of those areas where we think active management and where the data shows active management can can outperform benchmarks and do so consistently. Mm. And there's a couple of reasons for that, which I'm sure you raise as well. I think the, the, the universe of investments is so broad and there's so little research on a lot of those companies that there is an edge for people who are able to mm. specialize and focus on analyzing individual companies. This is where you would have got Prometicus from originally. Yeah. You know, it would have been a small cap sitting in there. Dubber potentially as well no. was one of the small caps that you were looking at as well. Oh, Zip. How dare um, you? But there, <laughs> there is so much. There is it is a rare market that is inefficient, and there is an edge, and it's evidence. And it's a developed by, market. What's rare about that is it's a developed market. Exactly. Yeah. And that's evidenced by the things like IDP falling fifteen percent, Paladin falling twenty, mm-hmm. companies falling fifteen or twenty percent in a single day, which tells you there's different levels of information, different levels of uh, mm. input from mm. analysts into that sector. So we see it as an, I don't think it's a bad uh, ETF, but I think it's a part of the market where you could go active. Yeah. I mean, 200 stocks, right? And the median market cap is- Three bill. Three billion. You're getting exposure to things like car sales and all that. Um, you're paying 0.3% in management fees. I just think if you blend that with say, I don't know, like, I'm not taking into account this person's situation, but um, if you blend that with, say, VAS, VAS, which is the ASX 300, you've got that tail, which is probably going to be in this ETF as well. Yeah. So you don't want that necessarily. Like, this isn't a pure exposure. Just, I think, pick, as Drew said, have the core portfolio, but have the very pointiest, best expression of the thing that you're trying to do. The best expression phrase comes from an old guy named Rodney that I used to know when he used to work with at Zenith. Um and he always used to use this phrase of the best expression, the best expression, because there are 101 different ways to do investing, probably one or two more, I'd say. But um, pick the one thing that really expresses your view in the strongest way. That's that product agnostic. Exactly. What is it? Yeah. Good golden rule, true, true, true. But I would go with an active fund, and I would actually want them to be true small cap in Australia. I mean, the issue I saw with VSO is 25% in mining and 14 in industrials. That's 39% of your portfolio in two sectors yeah. straight away. Yeah. You want, I think you want from a small cap Aussie, you, sure, you might. I don't really want my active managers looking at resources unless they're specialist resources investors. I want them looking at small cap industrials because I think that's where there's still some asymmetry. And that's it. So, I agree. So, Gilbert Mariner. <laughs> I don't understand this question. This is, this, I don't know if this is a question, but they've said, can you find a list of names who will receive money? And I've said, there's only one response to this I can possibly think of. Owen Rask, an account number. And BSB. And BSB will be attached in the show notes. So, if you want to send some money, um, I will receive money. So, Gilbert. Can you uh, send your login to <laughs> Uh, send us your credit card, all that sort of stuff. Thanks, thanks a lot, please. I appreciate it. Um, Mike writes in. Um, Mike Ox, we'll say. Um, Mike Ox says, "Love the podcast!" Exclamation mark. The people who write in with Mike know, even if your true name is Mike, we're not going to give you the award anymore because it's been done multiple times. Multiple. So Mike writes. Poor Mike. 
<laughs> Poor Mike's of the world. I uh, love the podcast. I have a question about defined benefit super. Jeez, this is going straight in your court. Mixed with a cash account, does having a defined benefit allow one to expose themselves to greater risk when investing their cash account money? Oh, Drew, that is yours all over. Thanks, Mike. I mean, I love and it depends. <laughs> okay. Two words of glory. Yeah. It is. I mean, this is a key role of a financial advisor is to consider these things for you when you're when you're looking at, you know, how do you make your money meet your objectives or help you retire earlier? So there's multiple, I think there's different schools of thought on this. And a lot of it does come down to where you are in your um, in your lifetime or in your retirement. Most, I assume this person isn't retired yet. And then it becomes, I think it's very challenging to think that just because you've got that defined benefit component, you can take heaps of risk with the rest of your capital without considering what the objectives are. Mm -hmm. that capital is because you define benefits locked up until you retire but then on the flip side we work with a lot of retired clients who have a defined benefit and that's exactly the way we would think about it if it's particularly if it's an income like Mm -hmm. a guaranteed income every year um that is to us the most value it's like an annuity it's the most valuable asset you can have so it does naturally treat you can treat that as a fixed income or cash component that's essentially guaranteed and allows you to hold more the, the other growth assets and not go out and buy additional bonds and cash and term deposits in the rest of your portfolio. So that's the way we've always thought about it and it gives you greater flexibility to do that mm. in retirement. But it, it really depends if you've got short-term objectives in other parts of your life. Okay. Uh, not many defined benefits around these days, uh, not being issued anyway. Mainly in medicine. Yeah. Um, teaching occasionally. Yeah. And outside the main states. Yeah, a lot of uh, principles have been, been around for a while. Thanks, Mike. Um <clears throat> <clears throat> couple of finnies, uh, sculling, Scull- sculling, <laughs> finnies. Um, we all wish we started investing earlier, they say. Well, I'd love to give my newborn nephew some ETF positions. What would be the best way to do this? Any relevant considerations or tax implications? Is this even possible to hold an ETF position or shares being a newborn? Um You've done this a few times. Yes. And I'll throw it back to you in just a second. But basically in Australia, uh, and uh, a child or a minor under the age of 18 cannot legally own shares. So legally is the key word, not beneficially, legally. Because shares in Australia actually imply a few laws that are, you basically are an owner of a company. And so a company is a legal entity. So you have to be of a sound mind and mature age to, in effect, be able to an owner of a company. Uh, and so that basically trickles down to mean that even miners can't own shares, yep. but they can be have beneficial ownership. And what that means is an adult can own them on behalf of a child. Um, and this is really important because in effect, the financial rights are the child's, but they don't pass to them until they're of a, of a certain age. Uh, and there are some things that you can Google online to find out about how your brokerage account p- could potentially set this up for you. Um, there are. I just want to clear up a piece of jargon that you might hear. When Drew and I talk about trusts on the show, we talk about the legal definition of a trust being something that you have to set up, kind of like a company. Yeah. But you can hold shares on trust for... A minor, and you don't need to set up the legal trust to do that. You're still in the application. Yeah. Um, and the way you could do that is you follow the instructions through your brokerage account. Now, for ETFs, there are impl- tax implications, and you should speak to your tax advisor or your tax agent. Um, and there are many ways to do this. You can invest in your partner's name, your name. You can hold them on behalf of your children. You can think about things like investment bonds, um, so many different things. But at the end of the day, I prefer to keep it simple. Um, depending on the tax bracket, I'm almost happy just to hold the shares my, in my own name, but for the beneficial interest of the child and then pass that to them once I've set it up correctly. So there's no major tax consequences when you pass the shares because that could yep. be deemed as selling, which incurs capital gain tax. And one final thing, Drew, I'll let you have yours, but um, yeah, I, I, want you, I want to probe you to talk about the importance of not just giving money to a child, but passing something along to them that's not financial, which is more important, being the education. Exactly. I think it's difficult educating a newborn. <laughs> well, yeah, you're not <laughs> going to- uh, this yeah. is what we discussed at the ASA event. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that was my first No, difficult to educate a newborn. Um, <laughs> newborn is hard in many ways. Yeah, um, but later in life. I think, well, Jamie was very- uh, was very, um, 
progressive or forward on it in that session, which was there's three things you can pass, but money and knowledge are two of the main ones. And knowledge is so incredibly important when it comes to finances because it's not really something that's taught in school enough. It's why you have so many listeners and support across your podcasts. Mm. Um, and I think it's the way we, the way I've approached it and the way I talk to older people that are managing, you know, or retirees that are trying to give something to their children is how do you make sure your children are engaging with that investment? You know, give them BHP shares like everyone did for the last 50 years, which kind of made sense because it was a success story. Yeah. But it's hard to for the new generations to engage and have interest in BHP. We don't want to know the price of iron ore is one hundred and ten dollars. It's you know how do you how do you find investments that are related to their you know this the t- type of work they do, where their interests are, what they what they're worried about or concerned about. So how do you find if you're going to invest broad based the better, as we'll say in these more diversification diversification the better, but find something they can relate to and have an interest in knowing more about. Could be you know renewable energy has been one. It could be tech, it could be cybersecurity, it could be mm. marketing. How do you find businesses and, and assets that are mm. – how do you humanize the investments? Because that's how you help in passing on education. There was a, <clears throat> there are a number of studies that show that most families' money runs out after the third generation. And I believe that's because the, uh, the, the lessons of earning money haven't been passed on and the importance yep. of earning money. So, the kids have got to earn it. But um, the, the thing with this is – if this is going to take you many years. I would use so, like, say for example, if you have like a date night, if you conjure you're in a barefoot investor, you have a date night where you talk about money for 15 minutes, and then you get on with the date, or you have an occasion when you talk to your partner about money and investing. What I would do is I would schedule a quarterly date night or a quarterly whatever you do, um, and check in with your partner to talk about your investment portfolio. Uh, he or she might be really on board with that. Um, and it's a great way to get them involved as well. And then when the kids are old enough, they will see that it's okay for you to talk about money at the dinner table. Yeah. And then that through osmosis. We call you. it dollar bucks, to be honest. Dollar bucks. Yeah. What does that mean? Bluey reference. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> I'm not at that stage yet, but thank you. Bluey's blue, which is really interesting. Um, it's a blue healer. It's a blue healer. Female, though. Yes. Female. Um, that threw me a bit because the dad's blue. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second, uh, but Bluey, Australian, uh, Australian iconic show. Uh, anyway, so we got sidetracked by Bluey. <laughs> Every the, the the two big things that I would say people uh, have a challenge with in Australia is they know money is important and they don't have the financial literacy. Yeah. So that that's a recipe for destruction. So when you have your children and they come of age, start to educate them in a way where it relates to them, like you were saying. And I would start with ETFs and that sort of stuff, but they're not going to understand that. But then eventually you go to Nike is the current example or Apple and you start to include those in the portfolio, maybe at the quarterly dinner nights or whatever. What do you call it? Dollar bucks. Dollar bucks. Yeah. Dollar bucks. Sounds like dollar reduce from uh, Simpsons. Um, so that's how I would do it. And I wouldn't restrict myself to one thing. The portfolio is not going to be that big, but start building the portfolio out and make a, an occasion of it. Great question because I'm super passionate about that sort of stuff. Uh, next question is a real uh, – do you have some bread over there? Because I'll just butter it for you, Andrew <laughs> Derrimuth. Uh, fanging it. Yes. Says, sound, really reminds me of my old days riding a, a Yamaha around the paddock. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, hey, broski slash finnies. I prefer finnies. Thanks for answering my elder's question on the podcast last week. This is a repeat offender. Uh, question this week. I managed to buy a bit of the FANG ETF over the past five months. This is the FANG Plus ETF from Globalex, just so you guys know. And I'm feeling like an accidental hero, assuming Andrew slash Drew is feeling pretty happy with his timing too. He is. Don't worry about that. Given $1 AUD by 65 US cents at the time of writing, we're at the lower end of the long-term average. My question is, how much, if any, impact does currency movement have on the FANG ETF share price? Noting the Aussie dollar has fallen from $0.73 cents to $0.65 cents at the start of this year, whilst at the same time, many of the FANG stocks have ha- had stellar share price runs. So is the FANG price all a result of the individual stock movements, or has currency movement played a role as well? In addition, should we be keeping currency movement somewhat in mind when buying US stock domiciled ETFs currently? Really enjoying the pod. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Fanging It, um, for a great question. So it's basically, let's generalize this a bit. It's basically with the Fang ETF. Um, 
how much do you consider currencies? So it's in AUD, so it's unhedged. Yeah. So what, literally every yeah. company in there is US domiciled. Yeah. So they earn US dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Or you pay um, everything, maybe some Ireland, Ireland. Yeah, maybe some tax in Ireland or Singapore. <laughs> Where they pay tax. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Um, so currency it, incredibly important. <clears throat> currency is incredibly important. I thought we should step back and and just confirm the performance of Fang. Okay, first. <laughs> let's just recap on that. Go for it, Drew. Oh, you want me to do it? Credit to me. Credit to you, mate. Credit, to, <laughs> credit to you. Um, that may be my best investment decision of all time, and I'm not sure if I'm going to close it out yet. Okay. Well, if you annualize it, it would be very impressive. <laughs> it's a pretty bold call. A but we rate. did say, I think we did say late 2022. Our oh, Facebook was down 70%. It was. But we're like, these are like the greatest companies in the world. Yeah. And they're super cash flow they're not positive. Going anywhere. Sure, they might do layoffs, but that's only good for the business. Yeah. They've got a lot of excess. Sorry, dude, that could bring me some hate. <laughs> um, but. And so, no, but it is. Like, it, for the business, they needed to. Like, Google onboard oh, put tens on so of thousands. Much, so much flab is yeah. probably the best way to no, to explain it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, I get told my writing is flabby very often. So, okay. yeah, it is. you know, I don't get to the point. Probably help me explain <laughs> this podcast as well. <laughs> so, get to the point. So, let's all admire Drew's uh, call on this. But um, Currency, incredibly important. Currency, but there's a two-pronged effect here. You've got the currency that you buy and sell in, in with your ETF because that will yep. impact it. But you also have the currency impacts on the companies themselves. So in this instance, to answer the question of what drives the price, clearly it's the performance mm. of the stocks. The majority of it. Yeah. yeah. There and is a hedging. Uh, sorry, there's a currency impact. The falling Aussie dollar has helped significantly, yeah. but it's you know if it's up seventy percent, there's probably fifteen or twenty percent of that when the Aussie fell from seventy five to sixty five or something like that. It was probably where mm. the currency benefit came from. But an increasing Aussie dollar is a massive risk to this. You have to. It, like yeah. not just this, but any any, any S and P five hundred un, unhedged. If the Aussie dollar went to you know back to a dollar, that's like a what a fifty percent gain. Yeah, that could it could wipe away a lot of profit that you've got on investments over the last few years. Um, I mean, Jamie, you talked you would have meant to talk to him about it a few times before, and it's all about having frameworks and decision making frameworks for things like currency because they're not controllable. Mm. But how do you how do you reduce or remove an additional risk from your portfolio? Yeah. Um, did blend, you know that rule. Yeah, did blend a little bit of uh, hedged IHVV yep. into the core portfolios recently. Yeah. Um, not all of the portfolio. Don't go all or nothing. But yeah. You start- don't have to get it precisely right. You yeah. just don't want to get it precisely wrong. Yeah. The, and just to reference Drew's rule uh, is uh, two standard deviations. And you can check that. I have never put the link in the show notes, but there's a website that I created that does that checks that for you. Um, Credit to you. Credits. Well, just buttering my own bread for a minute. Why not? We? <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're near the lower bound of that two standard deviations. With what it's fair to say. So this is a statistical rule. It's not necessarily like going to work. Yeah, um, but that's where you start adding hedging, or if you you yeah. switch to a hedged option for some of your investments, and yeah, yeah. The one thing I actually had a rant about this on LinkedIn. Should have brought this up at the beginning of the show for a change. Is um, <laughs> a lot of people make decisions based on a zero tax environment. So where you just said you would make the shift, that would you should know the tax consequences. Trigger CGT. Yeah. yeah. If if you're in a retirement phase, it's obviously a very different consideration than if you're in accumulation phase and you're in a high tax rate. So all you can basically do is choose where to allocate new dollars, yep. not necessarily. So you're not going to be perfect at it. Um, so that's why we just put it in as a, an allocation of our IVV allocation. We just said, if you're going to add more money, start to get the hedged version in there. Um, it costs a little bit more, but that's okay. So at the end of the day, I would be making a decision on fame based on the companies, not based on the currency. Like That would be my first consideration, yeah. then currency. Yeah. And there isn't a hedged option from GlobalX, is there? There isn't, but I'm sure you could – I think just the market for that for it isn't that big yet. Yeah. But there's good- plenty of ways you could do it. Though. Like <clears throat> if you look at the makeup of IVV – yeah. You could buy a hedge version of IVV because about 30% or 40% of that's the fangs anyway. Yeah. So you're getting a semi so you could similar some exposure. Of yeah. 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 Um, that's actually, not personal advice. That's not personal advice. No, no, we're not. Never. But um, there was, I did speak to, as I was saying, Mike Kemp earlier on, and <laughs> how's this? Um, he bought the Berkshire Hathaway A class shares in 2010, 11, when it was like, a dollar, dollar ten on the currency. This is a hundred thousand dollar per share, by the way. If you haven't had a chance to um, look at this, go into Google and go BRKA 
And what that means is the Berkshire four hundred ninety six thousand dollars. Yeah, but he sold when the currency fell to fifty five cents. So he, uh, by my rough calculations, he three xed plus doubled on the currency. <laughs> currency is important. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move on. We've got a couple more questions. So, um, so Charlie Munger eats out. Says, um, <laughs> how much is enough for retirement? <laughs> this question has been on my mind lately, particularly in terms of uh, achieving financial stability. Assuming no one has paid off, assuming one has already paid off their mortgage and cleared up any outstanding debts, what else needs to be considered when taking the leap? For instance, let's consider a 5% gross return on a portfolio of $1.5 million outside super. This would yield an annual income of $75,000 reduce. By living off the dividends while allowing the re- remaining amount to compound with an average of 3% after subtracting dividends, as long as the lifestyle can be maintained, what other variables are required to think about? Well, there's a lot, to be honest. So you're assuming 5%, which is probably below a balanced portfolio. Maybe, yeah, if that's a gross return, 5% is probably a bit low um, because you need. that means you're not even keeping pace with inflation. So even if your dollar value goes up, your inflation-adjusted value might be falling. Then subtract your living costs. Um Drew, yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different rules here, but um, personally, like, I think one big emotional thing, I know you're going to talk about different things, but one big emotional thing is I often think about this. If I had a $1.5 million, maybe I could retire if I knew exactly what I was going to do with my money and I felt very confident in my skills, but the more money you have, the less fearful I would be. Yep. And at that where you sit on that spectrum is very different for maximizing probabilities from that point, yeah. Yeah. Um how much are you going to keep working? Are you not going to keep working? All of these types of things. Which well, we just did that interview with John Glass, I might share that yeah, with yeah. you as yeah, well, great. which was talking about that retirement. He's going to be the retirement, event. retirement. Yeah. He'll be um yeah, we're hosting a session with him talking about the transition into retirement and the physical and mental challenges that come with it as well as the financial. I don't know if I put that link in the show notes last week to the retirement event. That's all right. I don't, we don't, we don't want it yet because <laughs> it might be overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a big venue. It's all right. Okay. Go on. Beers are on me. Oh, that's very big. That's a big statement. Lots of fang winnings. I mean, I tend to, because we do so much retirement, we actually spend more time outside the investments than on the investments with these discussions. So you're talking about a 5% gross return. Yes, feels a little low. Yep. I think average return from a balanced portfolio of assets is CPI plus 4 to 5. So it's 7 8%. Yep. Our rule of thumb is about 5% income every year. You spend that and you allow it to compound. I think one of the challenges with that is that it doesn't compound that At rate every number. year. Yeah. Like the market's up 10% so far this year. It's down 17 last year, up 12, whatever. Every year is completely different. So you have to be able to, the big one for us, I think it's a golden rule as well, Ugh. is disconnecting the income produced from your portfolio from the money that you're spending. You need to think about managing cash flow than just the dividends that are coming in. I've seen too many people you know, have stressful and disappointing retirements because they're too worried. They're only looking at what Telstra paid. If mm. Telstra cuts a dividend, they can't buy the same, can't, out, can't go out for dinner. But you need to look at your expenses over a long period of time and your income over multiple cycles, not just over one year to the next, I think is a big one. Um, and I mean, what else you what else you worry about? Are you, are you not similar to what we said before, precisely wrong? How do you make sure that you're – all the income you're getting is immune from what's happening in the markets on a short, medium-term basis. How do you avoid losing 20% on bonds last year? How do you avoid being caught up in dividend cuts from the mining sector? So it's about diversification, having you know, having portfolios that are built for resilience and, and multiple economic conditions. I'm interested in this question because um, I wonder, there's two really un- two things that we would never know. One is how many people are there? To be living off five percent of one point five million, uh, and two, do you own your own house? It seems like you do if you paid off your mortgage, but um, that's a big asset. So um, yeah, there's a lot here. This if this was a situation, get advice. Even if you just want one once off for advice, just get it. Um, speak to someone uh, and get an opinion because that's a good one. Um, so we've got time for a couple more questions here, Drew. Um, this one, I might. Ju- okay, why don't, why don't we jump down to the next one, which is Indy Bo Tom, who says, it would be, I think uh, the question is, looking at using chat GPT to build me a stock screener, 
what would your top five indicators be to help screen? Hard one for me. <laughs> you are a professional stock picker. No, you're not. Um, <laughs> so so Andy Gerber. No, I've got, I put it, I put a couple down, and they're all pretty vanilla. But it, to to be honest, because we focus on retirement, it's all about quality. So, what are the big drivers of quality companies? Yeah. Um, and it's looking beyond. You know, we get focused on PEs and dividend yield. I kind of throw them out. You know, you can. You know, ah. CSL has been on a thirty times PE for its entire life, and it's gone from two dollars to three hundred dollars. So, and a stock split in there somewhere too. I look at important, like important things, same things as I look at in my own business, which is what's the margin? Mm-hmm. So what's their operating margin or their profit margin? Is it solid and they're mm-hmm. able to protect it? That goes into like what's the return on equity? What's their earnings growth? So are their earnings and probably more cool. importantly lately is cash is sales and, and converting sales into cash flow, mm-hmm. which is no one cared about it for the last two years, but they cared about it. Recently, not when VCs were bankrolling <laughs> everything. They might run. <laughs> and then debt to equity. You know, the last thing you want is a blow up that's driven by debt. And we know that credit Especially markets now. can blow up overnight, and you can lose access to funding, and your company can can disappear essentially. So yeah, it's very. You can tell they're just essentially the key ratios of a quality focused investor. One of the things that um, yeah, the whole. I think I always like to refer to the credit markets doing behaving poorly as a freeze because i think that's a good way to think about it yep. is credit markets freeze shut where they yep. don't issue money to borrowers so i'm going to just take a backward step i would only ever design a screen if it matched my investment philosophy so you need to make a screen that view- matches the way you want to invest in individual stocks and sure you could use chat gpt to help you do that but it's probably not going to be perfect so let me tell you how i would do it according to the five rules that i set out in uh, the rask investment philosophy this is this applies for the stocks or the companies that we buy it does not apply to the etfs or the funds that we research and invest in but for the stocks i want companies to have a strong competitive advantage drew mentioned one of the best ways to measure that is through return on invested capital measure that over time so roic is the shorthand for that Um, Number two, I want my management teams to be aligned and transparent. Um, So this is an interesting one. You can't necessarily screen for this, but what I like is all like founders and families at the helm, or at least people that have a significant amount of ownership. So I'm sure there's some software out there where you can screen for, does the board of directors and executive team own X? Um, But it's actually interesting because if you screen for ROIC, you would get like return on investor capital, you would f- probably find businesses with a competitive advantage yep. and they tend to have high outside ownership. So those two are related. Um, but you want the return on investor capital to be screened like an average of the past three years or something or five years. Um, number three, the businesses must fit within my circle of competence. And so that would be the same for anyone. So I tend to screen for fintechs, software companies and industrials. I don't know much about mining, so I just screen that out typically. Number four, uh, the business must have a large and growing addressable market. And so the way I would screen for this is I would look at revenue growth. It sounds pretty crude, but I would look at revenue growth over three, five, or 10 years and try and then filter by that. So again, filter by that. And finally, I look for businesses. Well, this is probably not necessarily something that you need to screen for, but it might be something in your next stage, which is the valuation. Um, but in terms of being reasonably valued, what I'd look for is maybe just companies that have low debt to steal Drew's idea. Because, so let's just recap. We've got high return on invested capital. We've got owner operators at the helm, so management teams with founders or families. Uh, in the circle of competence, so in the sectors I want to look in, and it ha- must be growing over time. This is only the start of a much, much longer um, investment journey for me, an investment research journey. So Drew, I reckon we've got time for one more question. Which one do you want to jump to? I feel like the... Uh Industry super fun might be one for next week. <laughs> it's a big one to unpack. Oh, yeah, that's a big one for next week. Uh, so which one do you want? Uh, let's go Art Vandelay, a reference to uh, Seinfeld. Okay, Art Vandelay says, Hey, Owen and Drew, sitting on a decent cash balance in the portfolio ATM, which means at the moment, but it'll also apply on words. Self wealth, don't pay interest. Any thoughts on what would be a good option to get this cash to do some work? External high interest savings account, some type of ETF, AAA? Um, yeah, good question. I'm always worried to know that the... ETFs aren't necessarily cash. They're not cash in a bank account. And they're pretty quick to say on like on the BetaShares website, this is not a government guaranteed investment. Yep. So not that there's a problem with that, but basically it's invested into super short-term Australian government issued treasuries or bank issued bills. 
Mm-hmm. So that's like where all the money is going in the US amid the credit crisis. It's all going to money market funds, which are invested into this kind of really short term deposits issued by banks and governments. Um, I mean, keep it. Can I do a kiss? Yeah, <laughs> kiss. Say. Yeah. There's three options there. I think there's AAA, there's Bill, and there's cash from all the biggest providers, which they used a lot in seller in SMAs. Those are the ticker symbols, by the yeah. way. B I double L triple A cash C A S H. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <for> it. <laughs> yeah. But they they use a lot in separately managed accounts or SMAs and managed accounts because it allows you to hold a cash balance without having a yep. cash account in there. Um, but keep it simple. Put it into a high interest bank account. Macquarie's giving you five. Rabo is probably similar, ING be similar, or put it into a term deposit. Yeah, if I had a mortgage, I'd be whacking it straight on the offset oh, account. That's, yeah, always yeah. that one. Yeah, but then a term deposit or savings account next. For If this was money that I planned to invest in the next six months, I'd probably opt for a cash account over a ter- term deposit because you probably want to be nimble enough. Remember, if you break your term deposit, you might forego your interest. So probably want to be nimble enough there. But that's a great question and it's really important for a lot of people. I do also, this is an adjacent question, I do consider the cash that I have as my entire wealth as part of my core portfolio. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if it's in an offset or in a AAA, like ETF type style thing, read the PDS, et cetera. Um, but Drew, we've got to pick a questioner by their name and award them this week's award. We've also got to um, do your joke, yep. but I'll, I'm going to have to insert something else. It's really important. There may be no two cents next weekend <gasps> because I will be on the road and I apologize in advance. Week off, legs up. <laughs> um, so no, there will be. We've got heaps of interviews coming up, um, including an interview with Lawrence Cunningham. That'd be fun. That's fantastic. So um, keep sending us in your questions. We'll be back soon. Um, but Drew's going to give us a joke in just a minute. I'm going, maybe I'll go, I think you voted last week. So I am going to, can I vote? You can. Okay. So I'm going to- You're, I lo- you're a co-host as well. <laughs> this is true. I am a co-host. Uh, bro, no go with VSO. I agree. Yeah, yeah. was my choice because one, you tried to bait us into giving you the award, <laughs> but two, I think this is a really good question and it fits really well into what we try and talk about is like, it's not active or passive, it's active and passive. And we want you to think that way. Don't limit yourself because of something you read online about you have to do this or you have to do that. Just choose whatever works for you. And I think this is a really good one for that. So, bro, no go with VSO. You did include a few lads and a few bros in there, um, but that's it. And if you want to get in touch with Drew Meredith and the team at Waddle Partners, as you heard before, there will be a link in the show notes for financial planning. So, please put your uh, info in there and it gets sent across to them. But there's also an upcoming young, person's, um, young person in finance event. I have a link for that in there as well. There'll be a link in there. And as well, keep an eye out either via Rask emails or social media because we will be announcing that there is an event for people over the age of 50. It sucks if you're between 40 and 50 because there's nothing for you. But if you're under 40 or you feel under 40, sorry, Drew, or you're over 50, there's something coming up for you on the horizon. But- Do we put the leader of that event under the- Microscope? The leader. Who's running that event? Who's the leader? Go for it. You know who it is. It's Karis. <laughs> it's Muriel. Yeah. Muriel's running the event, so congrats to her. But um, there is some reprieve for the 40-year-olds in the house. Rask has just put the finishing touches on a 10-part roadshow. Oh, you, nice. will, you will be hearing more about this in early July. The events are in August and September. Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, not Melbourne this year. Terrelgan, Drew's coming to all these this way, scratching I'm his in. head. Wangaratta, Drew's old haunt. Um, <sighs> Sydney, Newcastle, Port Macquarie, Townsville, and I know I forgot someone. Gold Coast, Brisbane. These are all on the list this year. This is exciting. Sorry. Caravan? Hobart. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We do the Hamish and Andy style. Yeah. yeah. Bring the kids. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. Great. Um, so let's take us away. Get in contact with Drew. Get in contact with me via social media. See the links in the show notes. Uh, Drew, take us away with a joke. So this one's for all the parents out there. <laughs> Does a griddle count? My son wanted to know what it was like to be a parent. So I woke him at 2 a.m. to tell him my sock came off. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You should try that at home. Well, this was a heap of fun. Drew Meredith, thank you as always for joining me. It's good to be here. Good to see you.
Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF or ASX JEPI, J E P I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.